ask the Lord to join us here in a special way and to inspire us. Heavenly Father, we need you. We are desperately in need of your spirit, Lord, and we're so thankful that there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And so, Lord, we pray for your, uh, that we will be a sense and aware and believe uh, and claim your spirit so that we can have all the power necessary to, to honor you in our lives and to be ready for your coming. So guide us in our discussion now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God has always wanted to live not just with his people but in his people. He wants to dwell in us. Remember he said way back uh, in when he was designing and preparing to have the sanctuary built. He says, let them build me a sanctuary that I might dwell with them. He wants to dwell with us and he wants to dwell in us. And so um, when we look at the history of the children of Israel and we uh, see them going into captivity, we see that 400 plus years in captivity, they did not have the, they lost the, the relationship with God. They lost sight of God in many, many ways. And so when God, when, when God called Moses to deliver them out of that Egyptian bondage out of which is symbolic of the slavery of sin when he delivered them uh, he had to reprogram them he had to re-educate them because they had lost uh, to the most for the most part a knowledge of him his love his plan for their lives and so we recognize we see that uh, they needed this educational process. And so we want to just go in, um, in the word here for a little bit uh, to recognize that this has always been God's desire to re-educate his people, to take us from sin into a life of joy with him. And so uh, one of the things that the children of Israel desperately needed was his law they had lost sight of his law and that's why God gave the Ten Commandments he laid out those commandments to them so they would have a picture of the of, of the promise that God had for them if they would obey him that he would write his law in their hearts if the, in, that, that through his spirit so the law of God uh, God's gift uh, the law was God's gift to his recently freed children uh, one that, if appropriated, would include all other blessings. So he needed, they needed something very special in order for them to be able to be in, living in obedience to his law. So the Spirit was God's gift to the New Testament church as well. When claimed by faith, it would bring all other blessings in its trail. So I believe that the understanding and the study of God's Spirit is really has been neglected to a large degree uh, within Christianity. The power of the Christian is not in the head knowledge but it has to take the head knowledge, has to be moved and transferred and, and uh, inspired and, 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 and infused into every part of us and it has to come through His Spirit. It's put into us through His Spirit. And so I want to just go back a little bit and see what God wanted to do with his children down through history and, um, and how we, to a large degree, feel independent that we don't, we don't recognize how, our, well, how big a need we have. And so going back to Exodus chapter 19, if you could go in your Bible, to go back, go to the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 19. And this is uh, the story of 
the after the deliverance that God made of the children of Israel and starting in verse 1 it says in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai for they had departed Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness so Israel camped bef before the mountain and Moses went up in verse 3 Moses went up so sort of Exodus 19 and verse 3 and Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain saying thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself now therefore if you will indeed obey my voice and do what keep my covenant then you will be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine so what was God's plan for his people he wanted them to be what what, did he, what does he say you I want you to be a special treasure a special treasure it's interesting because if you were to go to Titus chapter 2 it says that God um, God delivered his people and he he calls them a what people a peculiar people a peculiar people very similar God God wants his people to be obedient surrender to him obedient to him surrender to him and if anyone who is is surrendered to God and doing his will through his power is a special treasure a peculiar people zealous of good works zealous of, of doing good and so he goes on to say so he had a plan that he would have a special treasure do you know that God has called each of us to be a special treasure to him and that is so precious to know that God has called us he calls us a special treasure and in order to be at that special treasure what did he say we were to do we were to obey his voice and keep his covenant now is that easy to do if if we're trying in our own strength it is impossible to do but if we are if we are living and allowing his spirit to come into our hearts we can do it because it's not us but him doing it in us it's learning to be dependent on him so he says therefore I will indeed if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of what priests and a holy nation these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel so Moses came and called the elders of the people he laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him then all the people answered together and they said what did they say all the all that the Lord has spoken we will do now has anyone here ever made a promise to God that all the things that he is that he has spoken to you that you would do anyone ever done that Every, any, I, I have anyone ever said God I'm going to do what you've asked me to do I'm going to be obedient to you I'm going to honor you I'm going to serve you has anyone ever failed to do what they said they were going to do I have I have I have and it's so the children of Israel are very confident that they could they could um, obey his voice and keep his covenant they were totally confident that they could do that and they promised all that the Lord has spoken we will do so Moses brought back the words to the, of the of, um, of the people to the Lord and the Lord said to Moses behold I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe forever okay God wanted them to believe for how long forever 
and he promised. So this indeed was the desire of God from time immemorial. At the foot of the mountain, three times Israel promised all that the Lord had spoken we will do. You'll find that in Exodus 19.8, in Exodus 24.3, and in Exodus 24.7, three times Israel promised all the words the Lord has said we will do. He said, and, and, and over and over again, they promised, they promised, they promised. And over and over again, they broke their promise. They, there was something missing. They didn't sense their need. They didn't ask God for help to obey him. They, re they thought they had the strength to obey. Now, looking in the history of Israel, how well did they do? Did they honor God? Did they serve him? Did they follow him? They didn't. It's a sad story of rebellion. They ended up getting a king, and, and, and then the king, and all the kings, and there were so many bad kings, so many kings who didn't serve and love God. Every now and then, the good one would come along. And so, uh, so in, in um, God recognizing that they needed strength, and God knew that, but they didn't ask for it, but in, in the book of... Um, uh, in the book of um, Ezekiel, chapter 36, we read, and it's about a thousand years later. So God has let them go for a thousand years, and, and, but, they, but so many were in rebellion. So a thousand years later, he comes through the prophet uh, Ezekiel, and he said, um, so he was an exiled prophet, and God promised to make up for such pathetic, the, such a pathetic Israelite inability. God was going to make it up. How was he going to do that? And we, let's look in uh, Ezekiel 36 and verse 26 and 27. How was God going to help the problem, the plight, a thousand years of failure, and just a few who, who served and, were, and honored God, but so many didn't. So he, had a, he made a promise. And what was the promise? Let's read that together. I, in, in Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 and 27, what does he say? A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause or empower through the Holy Spirit you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So a thousand years later, God recognizing that there was something that they desperately needed, that they didn't sense that they needed, and so God had the solution to this miserable problem of obedience. We want to obey, but we can't obey without this gift. So he says, what, is, what, is human, what do human beings need? We need a, a new heart. He says, I will give you a new heart. And what else? A new spirit will I put within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and to do them. So what was the, what was in this, from this Bible verse, what was the desperate need that Israel had that they hadn't, as a group, received as of yet? They needed a new heart, and they needed, and the only way they could get a new heart was to receive what? His spirit. They needed his spirit in them. And so, in Acts chapter 5, we, let's take a look at Acts chapter 5, because that same need that Israel had was exactly the same need that uh, was needed with God's New Testament people. The New Testament church, as it began, because we see the story of the disciples 
and the disciples walking and living with for three and a half years with Jesus Christ but they were not successful in their walk with Jesus they did not get they didn't understand what his mission was they thought their mission was that he was going to establish his kingdom and they were going to ones some would be on his right hand and some would be on his left hand they would have power position prestige honor and wealth so that was what they were looking for but God had a different plan and Jesus promised that he would do something very special for them their failure to to um, connect with Christ to have this relationship with him and to understand his vision uh, had to be resolved and the only way that he could resolve it was by fulfilling his promise and so if you look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 it says and through the hands uh, through the hands of the disciples many signs actually this is actually a little bit passive this is what the this is this was the result of having the Holy Spirit the result of having the Holy Spirit in the early church it says through the hands of the of the Apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch and yet none of the rest dared uh, join them but the people esteemed them highly in verse 14 and believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so the results of having the Holy Spirit poured out upon them and being of one accord brought about tremendous growth in the church so that they brought the sick onto the streets and lay them on beds in couches and at least that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them on some of them uh, and upon some of them what were they expecting with the with the, the shadow of Peter would follow them what were they hoping for for healing and it's interesting you know it's interesting and it obviously must be must have been working because in verse 16 it says also a great multitude gathered from surrounding cities in Jerusalem bringing sick people and those that were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed and they healed them all all were healed amazing this power of the Spirit that was at work and it says um, and in verse 17 the high priest rose up and all those who were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees and they were filled with what indignation I, I'm using the New King James here indignation it's interesting the disciples were filled with what the Holy Spirit those that were rising up against them who were rejecting the Holy Spirit they were filled with what indignation they were angry they didn't want to hear this truth so and, and and so they were filled with indignation they laid hands on the Apostles and put them in common prison but at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life now this is interesting because the law said their law was don't preach Christ you are forbidden to preach Christ now when when the law tells you to do something that's contrary to God's word what do you do you go with God in this case they defied the authorities and the angels worked with them to and they opened the prison doors and then they said and, and told them to go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of what life so when they heard that they entered the temple early in the morning and taught but the high priests and those that were with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and they sent to the prison to have them brought so they were planning on having a trial the Apostles um, but when the officers came and did not find them in the prison they returned and reported saying indeed we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside the doors but when we opened them we found no one inside now that was a problem that was a huge problem for the guards because what was the custom when when if someone was missing out of prison what was the custom they were killed so it doesn't say what happened here but I suspect that's what happened how do you, you, you know, there, it, that couldn't have happened I mean they're not believers and they didn't know that the angels opened the doors but it says 
now when the high priest the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things they wondered what the outcome would be so one came and told them saying look the men whom you put in prison are in the temple and teaching the people then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people lest they should be stoned and when they had brought them they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name in what name in Jesus name do you think this might happen again do you think that we might be forbidden for preaching the truth about the Sabbath and about the three the whole three angels message our message do you think that might come again Jane sent me an interesting uh, uh, report uh, Doug Batcher did a special a special coverage about a meeting that the Pope is calling for and it's as I believe it's uh, May the 14th is that correct May the 14th it's a it's a request from for leaders world leaders uh, you know sports figures and people of importance to come to Rome uh, musicians, people of importance, uh, you know, you know, they, he likes to have, you know, movie stars and all the, all the influencers in society, the Google leaders of Google and Facebook, and he meets with them from time to time because they, uh, he sees that they, these are the great men of the earth and that they can uh, have their influence on the, on the, on the, on the, on the little people like us, right? They can have their influence. So he's gathering together, and he and he and he read from, and he pointed out um, the special his special encyclical on the environment, and the encyclical on the environment. He he made reference to that, and he said he didn't say he didn't go into details about what the gathering was going to be for, but it was to I know Jane, do you remember specifically did he get did he say specifically what it was going to be the gathering for? Oh yeah, to take care of our common home. So that means it has to do with global warming, it has to do with the environment, and it has to do with um, a common problem that the whole world is experiencing. And so, you know, I've always believed that there had to be some thing that would bring the world together one problem that everyone would agree there's a problem and we would all come together and it's interesting in the document that in the document on global global warming uh, the environment and uh, help me to remember what it's called it's called yeah, anyone remember it's something C I forget the exact name I should have I, I wasn't planning on talking about it but uh, but it is our common home in other words, it's taking care. We need to take care of our common home. And the Pope has placed himself in a place that he is like the world, the, the catalyst to bring the world together. And he has a plan. And it's very interesting in that encyclical, there is a section on the Eucharist, how vital the Eucharist is, which is their fake communion service, which is based on the mass, which is a which is a which is really, if you were to look into it, is a, is absolutely heretical, according to the scripture. But the other point it brings out is that we need to come back to Sunday and and Sunday worship, just in the same way as the Jewish Sabbath. He says. Uh, they were not to work, they were to, for, even their servants were not to work, everyone was to, to rest. We need to come back on Sunday to worship and to rest. So that is very, very, very interesting. And he's calling for the whole world, leaders of the whole world everywhere. And just recently, he was in Saudi Arabia and had a very good meeting with the great Imam of the Saudi Arabian Empire, you might say. He was welcomed there very, very uh, kindly. And um, so he's pulling the Muslims, he's pulling 
people of all faiths, of all religions together to take care of our common home. And he will be looked upon by the world as the one that can be trusted, the one that can be depended on and, and have confidence in that this, this leader can solve our problems. And the other, other leaders are going to come together and they, they all are in awe of this man. You know, the man of the world, two times, Time Magazine, man of the world. Uh, not man of the world, but man, man of the year. Uh, so, so all I'm saying is, and I'm not judging the, the Pope, and you know, that's not for me to do, that's for God to do. But this is something highly significant. So you can watch it, I, maybe we have to have a way, uh, maybe we could have uh, Edith put it on a DVD for those who don't have YouTube to be able to watch it. But it's very, very good. And so Doug Batcher takes his, each of his words, each of his paragraphs, and breaks it down and to point out certain things. And it's not saying this is the, this is the National Sunday Law. We're not there quite yet. Uh, but everything is moving in that direction. There's no question about it. And things can happen very quickly. But when you see a crisis, like uh, the climate change, to me, the, 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 the climate is changing. I mean, you know, when, when they, and the things are melting and the ocean is open up in the Arctic. Uh, but what the cause of that is, I'm not going to get into a debate about that. But the reality is, you know, even some of these army bases, uh, navy bases, the water's going up so high that they, they can't, in, in any kind of a storm, uh, they can't even get to, they can't function on their base anymore. It's, uh, that's over in the, over in uh, near Washington, not too far from Washington. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not uh, well prepared to talk about that right this second. But the reality is there's a crisis. There is a problem. And who is going to solve the problem? And it's not going to be solved. I think this is all part of the unfolding of the last days. Yeah, you know, this earth will be growing old like a garment. And we are going to, we're not going to resolve the crisis of climate. Human beings are not going to resolve this problem. The only one who's going to resolve this problem is Jesus that is coming. But it will be a catalyst, I think. Uh, it will be a catalyst to bring the world together to look with confidence on a man and a system that will ultimately say the way to resolve, one of the key pay ways to resolve this crisis is that we all rest on Sunday. That the, the, the plants shut down, everything shuts down. Maybe we stop driving on Sunday. Maybe we reduce the amount of driving. Maybe we, you know, all kinds of things. We rest for the family for the for the for the for the for the planet and for God you know that's that's where we're going and um, we'll try to bring a little bit more information on that as time goes on so we will see these these this crisis bring the world to have to make a decision and it's going to be soon and those who do not comply will be very, very similarly treated as were the disciples in the time of, um, in, in the, in the, like in the book of Acts that we're reading right here. So they, God told them to go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life. We're called to give the three angels' message in these last days, prepare people for his coming, you know, to... Uh, this everlasting gospel should be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, what? Fear God and give glory to Him. Because why? For the hour of His judgment has come. God's judgment hour has come. God is currently judging all those who have died in the, in the faith, who profess to be Christians. He's judging all those who have responded to His love He's judging. He will determine. And then soon and very soon he will begin the work of judgment of the living. Before he comes, he has to have made a decision of who is on, who has, a, who, who has responded to his love, accepted his gift of eternal life, and are, will be ready, uh, and, and that, that want to be with him for eternity. There he will have a people. And the question is, are we getting to know him better? Are we surrendering our hearts to him 
more fully each day? Are we walking closely with Jesus? Are we, are we afraid or are we living in joy and in peace? The only way that we can live in joy and in peace is through the indwelling of his spirit. In the crisis, the spirit will bring us peace. And so, it goes on to say in verse 28, did they not strictly command you, did we not, we not strictly command you not to teach in, his, in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and, in, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter said, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, who ought we obey? God? No, he said, we ought, no, he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Keep that in mind. We ought to obey God rather than man. When laws are made that enforce false day of worship, false teachings of any kind, we have to stand with God, not men, even if it means our life. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you, have, you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God hath exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So God has raised him up onto his right hand. So Jesus is still working to be the prince and savior and to give repentance and, and, and uh, to Israel and forgiveness of sins through the power of his Holy Spirit. So it's very, very interesting that they were very clear about what they believed. And they were not afraid to speak he, not afraid to speak straight talk to the leaders of their day. Look, they, they're, uh, they're, they're angry with them, but they say, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus Christ. You murdered who, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Was that politically correct in his day? To say that you murdered Jesus? No. And it's really interesting that they use the word murdered, uh, you know, you killed him, because actually they did, they did put Jesus on a tree, on the cross, but his life was not taken by them. He gave his life for us. And then in verse 32, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to those who do what? Obey him. That reminds me so much of Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. And we are his witnesses to those things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who do what? Obey him. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. That, 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 is, that is so powerful. To those that obey him. We have to remember over and over again that obedience is the fruit of a living, loving relationship with Jesus. He gives us obedience. He gives us his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The fullness and um, the fullness of the Spirit would no longer dwell in the hearts of a few individuals. Pentecost changed all that. But as Joel had foreseen, God would pour out his spirit upon how much flesh? All flesh, every human being who is open to the spirit, he would pour his spirit out upon. God's spirit was poured out in Joel 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also, my, my men servant and my maid servants, uh, and uh, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so, praise the Lord. So the sons and daughters, the old and the young, the, and the humble, God will pour his spirit upon all of them. So when John the Baptist the man full of the spirit from his mother's womb came on the scene sent by God. 
he uh, to utterly uh, to utter the glorious promise I baptize you with water but Christ will baptize you with what with the spirit Matthew 3 11 the promise is repeated in all the gospel writers in Matthew in Mark in Luke and in John in in John he says and John bore witness saying I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove <clears throat> he remained upon him I did not know him but he whom sent me to baptize with water said upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him this is he who baptizes with the spirit so who is baptizing with the Holy Spirit Jesus and so that is God God is calling every single one of us into a relationship with him that we might have his spirit working in us and the day of Pentecost you can read that in in the book of Acts chapter 2 I just wanted to share just a couple of uh, of um, of quotations that are very inspiring the Holy Spirit the third party of the Godhead it says the Holy Spirit has a personality else he would not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God he must also be a divine person else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God this is for the faith I live by the Holy Spirit is a free working independent agent the, uh, the God of, of heaven uses the Spirit as a as he please as it as it pleases him human minds human judgment human methods can no more set boundaries to its working or prescribe the channel through which it shall operate then they shall say to the wind I bid you blow in a certain direction and to conduct yourself in a certain way in other words we don't have control over the Holy Spirit God wants to work in his church he wants to work in this church and that's why we really need to seek the Lord's guidance and and, and the pray for the infilling of his spirit from the beginning God has been working by his Holy Spirit through human instrumentalities for the accomplishment of his purpose in behalf of the fallen race the same power that sustained the patriarchs that gave Caleb and Joshua faith and courage and that made the work of the apostolic church effective has upheld God's faithful children in every succeeding age so does God's Spirit want to work in our church and our lives and our families absolutely the Holy Spirit is the highest of all gifts that Jesus could solicit from his father for the exaltation of his people the Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent so if you need transformation if you need change where are you going to get that change and power from from the Holy Spirit through faith in his gift given as a regenerating agent without this sacrifice without the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail I read that the Spirit was to be given as a regenerate agent without this the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail in other words along with the cross we need the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit to make effective what the cross has gained for us the power of evil had been strengthening for centuries and the submission of men to it, this satanic captivity was amazing sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power so we are uh, we have a power if you're struggling with not being able to overcome certain sins certain attitudes certain things the, the need is the part of the power of the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit is what we need we need to have an understanding of the gospel and then the gospel is made made effective 
and, and made alive through his spirit. That's why Jesus said we have to wait for the promise of the spirit and he would baptize us. That's why he said to us we must be born of the, we must be born again of the water and of the spirit. So let us pray daily and hourly for the Holy Spirit's guidance and blessing in our lives so that we can live, truly take all the truth of the gospel, the power of the gospel, and make it a reality through the indwelling of his spirit. Is that your desire today? Let us pray. Precious Lord, we need more than anything else your Holy Spirit. The third, you are so desirous of living in us. You want to give it, but you, you want to give the Holy Spirit to us, and you're more willing than a father to give good gifts to his children to give us the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we're so thankful that your Spirit comes into our lives as we ask and as we invite, and that you regenerate us, you recreate us, you renew us, and you, and you fill us with your peace, with your joy, with your comfort, with your strength, with every good gift. Lord, your spirit brings love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of the, all the fruit of those beautiful nine fruit of the spirit, uh, temperance, self-control, all these beautiful fruits, Lord, that are fruit that, that will uh, bring to us. Take the gospel and make it a reality in our lives. Lord, as the three angels' messages given to this world, may it be done in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we enjoy uh, knowing that, that you that have begun a good work in our lives will finish it. And Lord, may we have your Holy Spirit today. Ask, we, and Lord, point out our sins, anything that's in our lives that needs to be cleaned and taken away. Lord, your Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that. And so we submit to your spirit to work, to cleanse, to purify, and to bring us joy and peace in, this, in the challenges of life. And Lord, whatever the Pope may be doing, whatever other leaders are doing in the world, Lord, we can not have to have any fear through all this, but we, we can look up and say, our redemption draws nigh. So thank you, dear Lord, and keep us in your loving care, filled with your spirit, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.